share for a few moments on the subject of grace and hope. This past week we had another act of violence in the schools and I think it's so important that we engender a sense of hope in the country and to realize that change is possible. As I reflected on the young man who was stabbed last week, I thought about another young man. This young man, when he was about 13 years old, got in, into an altercation with a classmate, beat the classmate's head on the ground, on the concrete. The classmate pulled out a knife and attempted to stab him. The same young man, about a week later, assaulted a teacher, got thrown out of school. During that same year, he assaulted his father, pulled out a machete for his father, and within another period of about six months, the young man ended up hitting another young man in his face with a, a tree limb. The young man that he hit returned, tried to run him over with a car, came out with a shotgun, and ran the young man through the bushes, and the young man escaped by entering one of the neighbors. That young man today is the chaplain of the House of Assembly. <laughs> because of the grace that was afforded me, I ended up working with, another young, with a number of young men here in the Bahamas. And in the same way that I received grace and saw my life change, I was able to assist many others in changing their lives. In the past 10, 15 years, three of the engineers at our church were former gang members. In fact, the engineer at the church right now was the young man who was considered lost in life. And we have seen so many men turn their lives around. Actually, the gentleman today who's the senior pastor of our church in Freeport and Orlando was a young man from the streets of Bain Town whose life was turned around. He ended up going to college, getting a master's degree, becoming married, have a family. And this was a young man that people had very, very little hope in. Today, I brought another young man here with me just to show, show a little bit of the face of hope. This young man sitting next to, standing next to me, we call him Landlord. And he has an interesting story because his life changed at the House of Assembly. At the age of about 12 or 13, he began sleeping in cars. And he didn't know who his father was. His mother had medical challenges, and so he had no one to turn to. He ended up being involved in a gang. Uh, from he was about 13 or 14, he was robbing people with no mask, and ended up in a lot of negative situations. But a group of us, we were doing an outreach at the time called Peace on the Street. And we ended up right here in front of the House of Assembly and he happened to be walking and we accosted him and suggested that he needed to change his life and that day he did make that change and today he is a husband, he's a father, he, has a, he is a businessman he's also a recording artist that has music, had, had music on the charts in Jamaica and Europe and 
Today he has a syndicated television program in 25 countries. He never finished high school, had no formal education. Um, and then about three or four years ago, he came to me and he said, he said, you know, Pastor Dave, you all did a lot for me. And so I want to give back. And he decided to give back and he asked me, how could he give back? And I said, okay, let's start a program. And so we started a program together called Second Chance. And Second Chance is a program where we went into the, the hoods and the streets and we picked up between 50 and 150 young men, primarily, every week. And we fed them, gave them food because many of them didn't have food. And a number of those young men have made a change. Some of them are dead today. Some of them uh, were in the papers for murder. Some of them uh, are in jail today. But these are the type of young people that we were working with. The good thing about it is there are some good stories. So there is hope. And I want to remind us that even in the darkest situation, there's hope. There has to be people, there have to be people willing to make an effort, and especially those who benefited from grace. You know, I could say a lot more about my story, but uh, today what I've decided to do is to um, give out a copy of my book. This is the book that I wrote. I've written 17 books, but this one is a particular book that just tells my story, and I use it as an example for young men to let them know what's possible if you make the right choices in life. Amen? Amen. So let's bow our heads together. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to once again deliberate over the important business of this house and of the business of the people. And Father, we thank you for your wisdom, your guidance. Thank you for understanding so that we can make the right decisions and right choices that will benefit our people. And we pray that the deliberations of the day would result in a favorable outcome. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our Father, our Father, be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, give us our bread, give us your holy bread, give us our 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 bread. Dr. Hubert Minnis, Peter Turnquist, Brent Simonet, Desmond Bannister, Randall Bell, Jeffrey Lloyd, Dr. Dwayne Sands, Marvin Dane, Frankie Kettle, Nico Diagula, Michael Pintard, Darren Hemfield, Ramal Ferreira, Denisha Rose, Red Bull Rose, Ellsworth Johnson, Philip Davis, Juan Miller, Patricia Parker Edgum, Aram Lewis, Carlton Bolag, James Aldrich, Travis Robinson, Adrian Gibson, Donald Saunders, Frederick McElfine, Hank Johnson, Mark Hume, Michael Pope, Miriam Repley Emanuel, Reed Shipman, Ruben Ramming, Ricky Mackey, Shannon Don Cartwright, Chanel Ferguson, Lennis Hannah Martin, Faisal Fork, Chester Cooper. I know the devotion this morning was a little different from 
our normal devotion, but I think it's appropriate on such a day, a day such as this. When I was growing up, people said to me that money was the root of all evil. And I concluded later on in life that the lack of money is really the root of all evil. And so on, on this day, um, we are grateful that that message was brought by our chaplain with respect to young men. Because most of the activities of our young men is, can be founded in the lack of money or the lack of being able to earn or demand money. Uh, honorable members, um, I have an email and I hope I pronounced this name correctly from Miss Saskia the Igala. Uh, she's inviting all members of Parliament to attend an art exhibition uh, between the hours of 1.30 in the afternoon and 5 this afternoon. The exhibit will be held at number 8 Virginia Street and the exhibit is being put on by the students of the Uriah McPhee Primary School. So an invitation is extended to all members to visit number eight Virginia Street when we break to view this exhibition and encourage our young primary school students. Also this morning, I'm holding in my hand a copy of the book that our chaplain has decided to give a complimentary copy to all members of parliament, if we can have them distributed right now. It is the power of positive choice. And if you look at the photograph, you may not recognize the chaplain, but I remember him in those days when he spotted this afro. So we can have those uh, books distributed at this time. Introduction and swearing in of new members. Honorable members, we have had an agreement between the government side and the opposition side to move into statements on the agenda, statements of communication by ministers, and then we will revert to the laying of documents after the statement by the honorable member for, for Kalani. Statements and communications by ministers. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Kelani. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, before I start, I need want to state that, yes, we have about three islands on lockdown at this particular point in time. And I've been communicating with regularity every day with all three islands. And I want to ensure that Andres is doing well. Andres is only complaint that there was a, a shortage of some food parcels and they've been reassured both Central and North Andres that those parcels are in, are in route. There are no challenges or problems with berries. All residents are doing well. And there are likewise no challenges or issues with Cat Island, as they too are doing well. And uh, the speaker, I'm sure individuals are looking and seeing this is a hefty, large document. And um, I may be standing for about two to three hours, and therefore I would get as comfortable as possible. <laughs> and um, as a result of this preparation, I would not have being able to do my regular 4.35 o'clock, 5 a.m. exercise. And I want to reassure those who I usually work out with that because of my absence this morning, I will be exercising at 3 o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, I rise on this occasion 
in this honorable house to present the 2021-2022 fiscal budget. Every year, the government of the day takes to the floor in this honorable house to report to the Bahamian people on its accomplishments and plans for the future. The national budget is not just a list of numbers, it tells the story of our values as an administration and demonstrates the vision we have for our nation. From Hurricane Dorian to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, we have collectively weathered an unprecedented level of social and economic shocks. There is no doubt that together these twin crises have presented the most significant obstacles for our continued national development in the last 100 years. Without warning, the environment in which we were left to govern shifted dramatically. To overcome these obstacles, last year's budget outlined my government's plan to stabilize our economy, provide much needed social support, invest in the rebuilding of Abaco and Grand Bahama, and plant the seeds for an exhilarated national recovery. The title of last year's budget, Resilient Bahamas, a plan for restoration, was not just an exercise in branding, it spoke to the social and economic strategy with it we put in place to beat back the most extraordinary crisis of our lifetime. Mr. Speaker, as we prepare for the year ahead, this new budget represents our plan to move from restoration to growth. It will build upon a new foundation and accelerate our national recovery in the process. We are still contending with grave uncertainty today, but my administration's ultimate objective has not changed. We may have been diverted, but our direction is still clear. Our North Star has always been to grow an economy that produces jobs, opportunity, health, and wealth for all Bahamians. Circumstances beyond our control may have shifted our immediate priorities and related initiatives, but our economic vision for the nation still remains the same. An economy that is resilient, inclusive, dynamic, and sustainable. We have faced unprecedented challenges. Mr. Speaker, last year's budget was almost entirely defined by the need for an immediate and impactful emergency response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And while many countries scrambled to manage the unfolding crisis, failing to maintain stability and to protect their citizens, the Bahamas, yes, Mr. Speaker, the Bahamas, was routinely held up as a model in the region and around the world for its effective management of the crisis. To date, the direct cost of my government's response to the pandemic has exceeded $290 million. This does not include the millions of dollars in lost tax revenue and economic activity for the Bahamas. At the start of the pandemic, the nation was still grappling with the catastrophe of Hurricane Dorian. 
the horror of the disaster, which resulted in the largest single loss of life in our nation's history, was still fresh. And post Dorian, post Dorian assessments estimated the cost of damages to be approximately $2.5 billion and an additional $1 billion was lost in government revenue. But, Mr. Speaker, it is not happenstance that we have been able to weather the storms confronting us. It is not a coincidence that we have navigated this global crisis with such responsiveness. And it is not by luck that we have been able to muster the necessary resources to provide for the most vulnerable. My administration had a plan. We implemented and invested in that plan. And through the execution of that plan, we are transforming this crisis into an opportunity for our nation's future prosperity. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, allow me to say a little about the resilient Bahamas plan. Mr. Speaker, my government adopted a well thought out strategy to address the unprecedented challenges we face. We implemented a well defined plan commonly known as resilient Bahamas. This included gathering the most recent public health, social, and economic data, and consulting with medical and other experts to formulate sound policies. Our approach was anchored by three primary obje objectives. And we sought to, one, protect the well-being and engender the confidence of our citizens and our residents. We sought to maintain economic stability during the COVID-19 induced crisis. And we also sought to plant the seeds for an accelerated recovery. And to achieve these objectives, this government defined its key priorities and designed a budget that would pour into each an unparalleled volume of public sector resources. And our priorities were clear. Protecting the health and safety of Bahamians. Providing adequate social support to vulnerable members of our society. Stabilizing the domestic economy sustaining employment, and accelerating our government's reform. This plan, and specifically our objective to plant the seeds of an accelerated recovery, was supported by the work of the Economic Recovery Committee. And the committee's mandate was to undertake an in-depth consideration of the nation's current economic health and to present a bold, a bold vision for a modern Bahamian economy. Mr. Speaker, I can unequivocally state that my government has pursued its priorities and achieved its objectives. The government has been focused and steady. And we can report that we did what we said we would do. As an update to members of this honorable house, under the resilient Bahamas plan, we invested the following as of the end of March, 2021. $25.9 million on COVID-19 public health and safety measures. And this investment ensured that our healthcare system and healthcare workers had the support needed to sustain us through the crisis. 118, 
$118 million in government-funded unemployment assistance. This budget contribution put cash directly in the hands of unemployed and self-employed behemoths impacted by the economic downturn. And this sum does not include and is in addition to the earned benefits that were paid out by NIB under its ordinary unemployment benefits program. $32.8 million in social assistance. This cash injection largely funded the extensive food assistance program supported jointly by the government and NGOs. It ensured that the most vulnerable had access to food. And as I stated earlier, Mr. Speaker, adequate food supplies during this lockdown have been shipped to the various islands and the additional need requested by Central Andres and South Andres are in route. $44.4 million in the government's payroll support program. This contribution allowed private businesses to use tax credit to pay their employees, saving approximately 50 15,000 private sector jobs. $53.3 million in business continuity support to Bahamian entrepreneurs and small businesses. And this investment provided hundreds of Bahamian businesses access to grants and government guaranteed loans administered by the SPDC to survive, expand, and jumpstart. Mr. Speaker, with these amounts, while these amounts represent the dollar value of direct COVID-19 support provided to the Bahamian people, I want to remind members that resilient Bahamas was a robust plan that looked beyond the immediacy of the pandemic. It is for this very reason that we included comprehensive policy solutions to prepare the country for what would come after we emerged from the crisis. From structural reforms to tax relief, these policy solutions included over $260 million in tax concessions to residents of Abaco and Grand Bahama. The Special Economic Recovery Zone orders were extended to June 30th, 2021 to continue to ease the burden of rebuilding after Hurricane Dorian. Relief on school supplies by the back the school tax credit program, the reduction on fishing and agricultural materials to encourage expansion in these areas, and this was coupled with $5 million in funding to businesses in these areas via the Axe Axe Auxiliator Small Business Development Center. And finally, Mr. Speaker, expanding the government's digital footprint. In fact, we exceeded our targets for the digitization of government services by providing digital processes for road traffic, Registrar General's Office, Department of Immigration, Police Force, and Cabinet Office. The Speaker, we are now I'm back on e-cabinet and we have embarked on e-passport, e-cabinet and I am happy that 
I can be anywhere around the world. Review cabinet papers, approve cabinet papers, and at the same time, review and approve cabinet conclusion without being here in New Providence. Then, Mr. Speaker, we cannot forget passport and the minister has launched passport offices in various islands and he will continue to progress. And then there's the health visa. And by also launching and expanding the digital process for the passport renewals, the passport, the port department, the customs department, court systems, as well as the Department of Social Services. Mr. Speaker, over the past few months, the opposition has continuously and falsely asserted the unfortunate misrepresentation that, I quote, the government does not have a plan, end quote. Mr. Speaker, despite this constant claim by the side opposite, not only did my government present a plan during this very same budget debate last year, we implemented it. And we implemented it successfully. As I have aligned, in many cases, we exceeded the commitments made this time last year. It is because we have invested such significant resources in the resilient Bahamas plan that we see a way forward. Because we have stuck to that plan and held to our commitments, we can begin to pivot away from the initial stages of restoration toward resilient, dynamic, inclusive, and sustainable growth. Mr. Speaker, since we proposed the resilient Bahamas plan during last budget exercise, the world has continued to change dramatically. Globally, the corona coronavirus pandemic has taken a toll on every country without exception. Like us, other nations are contending, contending with increased spending on health and safety measures. Depressed revenues, restrictions on the movement of citizens and residents, and unfortunately, the loss of life. But Mr. Speaker, we are encouraged that the panic and pandemonium surrounding the pandemic is now nearing an end. While our circumstances are still tenuous, an end to the worst of the pandemic is in sight with global vaccine deployment and health and safety measures proving successful. My government, Mr. Speaker, is continuing to adopt a structured approach to manage our recovery, building on all that we have been able to accomplish so far. Mr. Speaker, our plan last year addressed the need for an immediate response, but it was also forward-looking. And so, we set out to plant the seeds for recovery, to anticipate the opportunities on the other side of the crisis. Mr. Speaker, the seeds we planned are now germinating. To hasten their progress, during this budget, we present the Accelerated Bahamas Recovery Plan, or Accelerate Bahamas for short, to boost economic growth and continue our support of the most vulnerable. The Accelerated Bahamas Plan is designed to achieve the following objectives. To strengthen 
the impact of much needed COVID-19 related support, accelerate the engagement of displaced workers, stimulate domestic, economic, and commercial activities, extract greater value from the tourism sector, and accelerate the adoption of innovation and e-government technologies and services. And to achieve these objectives, our Exhilarated Bahamas Recovery Plan is built around seven pillars or priorities. Seven. One, job creation. We will continue and ultimately transition from providing unemployment support to implementing job growth policies that maintain and expand economic opportunities. And these will include incentives to businesses who employ additional staff. Two, small business development. As economic activity gains traction, we will pivot from keeping existing small and medium-sized businesses afloat to helping small businesses grow. Key to this is improving access to financial opportunities, expanding export opportunities, streamlining government bureaucracy, and increasing concessions targeted specifically at Bahamian entrepreneurs and small businesses. We will focus on new industry development like fishing, farming, and technology adoption to assist in diversifying our economy. Three, Mr. Speaker, healthcare improvements and vaccinations. We will continue our support for, for the public healthcare system by making one of the largest investments in healthcare in the history of the Bahamas. This will not only improve physical health infrastructure, but also through national health insurance, NHI, ensuring free primary health care to all. Through targeted initiatives, we will continue to encourage all who are able to become vaccinated. We will also expand the implementation and adoption of telemedicine to improve access to our healthcare system across the Commonwealth. For Mr. Speaker, tourism development. We will enhance the Bahamian tourism product to allow for home porting of cruise vessels, thereby giving SMEs the opportunity to access new opportunities in tourism value chain. Speaker, during this debate, the Minister of Tourism will expand and discuss new developments. Five, public and private sector investment. We will significantly improve our national investment framework, and this will include enhanced programs for expedited infrastructure development, improved access, land, and home ownership and a new streamlined framework for quality domestic and foreign investment. And six, Mr. Speaker, digitization and innovation. We will continue to accelerate the digitization of government services using technology to increase the efficiency of revenue collection, improve service delivery, and expand access to citizens and residents who do not live here in the capital. Seven, fiscal responsibility. We will maintain our focus on fiscal reform through strengthening the collection of existing taxes, improving tax policy, ensuring equity in government taxation, and focusing on new areas of revenue generation. Mr. Speaker, 
As we continue to lead the country out of the ravages of this pandemic, we are confident, we are confident that our efforts thus far have positioned the economy to be robust and sustainable. The exhilarated Bahamas Recovery Plan defines the next steps in our ultimate mission, which is to not only recover, but to thrive in a post-pandemic world. Mr. Speaker, before presenting my government's budget for the upcoming fiscal year, I would like to first discuss the prevailing global and domestic macroeconomic conditions. Having an understanding of these realities will provide tech context for the understanding of the 2020-2021 fiscal performance. This context will also help in understanding the environment in which fiscal projections and policy measures for 2021-2022 fiscal year have been developed. Mr. Speaker, we are all aware of the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on global output, on global value chains, on global logistics channels, on healthcare systems, but most importantly, on lives and livelihoods. Unfortunately, no country in the world has been able to escape the grasp of this pandemic, whether directly or indirectly. All citizens of our global village have had some element of their lives disrupted because of COVID-19. The IMF, International Monetary Fund, in its January 2020 update to the October 2019 World Economic Outlook Report, projected the global economy to grow by 3.3%. However, as COVID-19 virus was declared a pandemic, global growth prospects were significantly lowered in April 2020 to minus 3.0% for both developed and developing nations alike, with an estimated rebound of 5.8% for global growth in 2021. For the Bahamas and other Caribbean nations who commonly experience disasters in the form of climate events, the pandemic presented a grim new challenge. Mr. Speaker, unfortunately, due to the appearance of new, more infectious COVID-19 strains and the occurrence of first and second waves in many countries. By April 2021, the IMF estimated the 2020 global impact of the coronavirus on global output to have been slightly steeper. In retrospect, it is estimated that in 2020, the global economic contraction was slightly worse at 3.3%. However, the global development of vaccines the outlook for a global rebound in 2021 is a more optimistic projected growth of 6.0%. Mr. Speaker, the critical importance of tourism as our primary export earner requires that we monitor very closely the outlook and performance of our major source markets, especially the United States, which accounts for 80% of our visitors. And despite the effects of the coronavirus pandemic, the IMF revised upwards its 2022 forecast for the United States economy to a 3.5% contraction from an earlier 5.9%. And the rate of economic rebound for 2021 was to 6.4% from 4.7%. Similar, similarly, for Canada, the initial 2020 estimated economic contraction of 6.2% was lowered in April 2021 
4%, and the outlook for 2021 is also more optimistic, with the economy expected to rebound by 5.0% compared with the original estimated 4.2% growth. For our regional partners, Jamaica and Barbados, the outlook is for a slower recovery than earlier anticipated, as their tourism dependent economies also grapple with the impact of the second and third wave of the pandemic. Real GDP, Mr. Speaker, real GDP growth for Jamaica and Barbados is now expected to be 1.5% and 4.1% respectively, down from the earlier 3.5% and 7.1% estimate. My point is, Mr. Speaker, for hotel workers, restaurants, taxi, and tour operators, for Airbnb owners, the improved, out the improved economic outlook for our major tourist markets bring a sigh of relief. As the U.S. and Canada continue with their vaccine programs, coupled with federal stimulus initiatives, their positive economic recovery presents opportunities for an accelerated rebound of the Bahamian economy if we are prepared to take advantage of it. Mr. Speaker, as we are all too aware, the COVID-19 pandemic has forced the most significant restrictions on movement of people in modern times. While necessary to protect the health and safety of citizens and residents, these restrictions have presented significant economic challenges to tourism-dependent economies like our very own. And the severity of the pandemic on tourism was very pronounced as evidenced in the decline in number of visitors for the Bahamas. In July 2020, at the beginning of the fiscal year, visitor arrivals totaled approximately 24,000 people, some 96.3% lower than the year prior. For stopover visitors, arrivals totaled just over 15,000 visitors, a contraction of 91.3% of the pre-COVID-19 year prior. And these numbers represented an unheard of decline in our tourism industry, resulting in falling government revenue and a slowing of domestic economic activity. But despite these challenges, Mr. Speaker, foreign direct, direct investment, FDI led projects, coupled with continued post-store and rebuilding efforts have provided some mitigating economic impact to offset the fall of the leisure sector of the economy. Mr. Speaker, on the property front, short-term rentals in the Airbnb market have already shown signs of rebound since the careful reopening of our tourism sector in November. Occupancy rates have more than doubled from 8.2% in November 2020 to 16.6% .6 in March 2021. At the same time, there was a 2% increase in average daily rental rates and a 52% increase in room reservations. And based on central bank data for the period end March 2021, vacation home rentals and compar comparable hotel listings increased by 65.9% and 55.4% respectively. This also impacted daily room rates, which similarly increased by 10.8% and 7.3% to $497.95. Or $497.95 and $169.63 for vacation home rentals and hotel listings, respectively. 
The domestic economy, Mr. Speaker, also benefited from the continued decline in global oil prices, which has contained domestic inflation at 0.04% in the 12 months to February 2021, compared to 2.2% in the same period of the prior year. Mr. Speaker, as we look at monetary aggregates, both bank liquidity and external reserves demonstrated mild contractions during the first three months of 2021 as compared to the prior year. Overall monetary supply stood at $8.034.7 million at the end of March 2021, an increase of 0.8% over the prior month and a contraction of 2.4% as compared to the prior year. Growth in Bahamian dollars, credit of $100.4 million in the first quarter of 2021 compared to the 9.4 million contraction during the same period of the prior year and was primarily driven by the government's use of short-term funding facilities. And throughout the pandemic, the country has maintained a healthy level of external reserves with continued, which continued to provide credibility and stability to our exchange rate arrangements. At the end of April 2021, external reserves stood at 2,253 million dollars an increase of 12.7% over the 1,994.9 million held in March 2020 at the outset of COVID-19 pandemic. Despite the loss in currency earnings from the key tourism sector, this administration prudently changed its debt management policy to seek U.S. dollar borrowings to ensure an adequate level of foreign currency to support imports during the worst of this crisis. The central bank, in conjunction with Ministry of Finance and officials, will continue to monitor these developments to ensure the U.S. bohemian dollar peg is not threatened by these developments. Mr. Speaker, I do wish to reiterate the point, however, regarding our external reserves, because it is important for this House and the nation to note. Notwithstanding the worst economic calamities to befall the Bahamas in its recorded history, it is the prudent management and planning of this administration that has ensured that our foreign exchange, exchange holdings remained healthy and robust. That means, Mr. Speaker, that our Bahamian dollar has remained as strong as it has ever been. We have protected the value of the Bahamian dollar and thus the value of assets of all Bahamian citizens and residents. The Bahamian dollar, Mr. Speaker, has not and will not come under any threat of devaluation as long as this administration remains in office. We take seriously our responsibility to the Bahamian populace to protect the value of the Bahamian dollar. Mr. Speaker, for the Bahamas, with a largely tourism-driven economy, our economic rebound and a positive economic outlook for the restoration of the Bahamian economy will be linked to three major factors. One, 
restoration of economies of our neighboring economies. Two, the ability to contain and combat the pandemic locally. And three, energizing our domestic economy by embracing new approaches and new opportunities. Just a moment ago, Mr. Speaker, I described the outlook for the restoration of our neighboring economies. So I will shift my attention to the second and third factors. While our strategies to contain the worst impact of the coronavirus pandemic have been <coughs> successful, I must yet again remind Bahamians to remain vigilant. I am vaccinated. Most of cabinets are vaccinated. All the press are vaccinated. I urge the Bahamas to follow. I would like to thank the Bahamian public for adhering to emergency protocols. I say to them, your adherence to protocols has allowed us to avoid a collapse of our healthcare system even in the worst of times. However, as the Bahamas wraps up its vaccine program, now with vaccination sites on over 15 islands, and many of us, myself included, now receiving second doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine, we are well on our way to returning to normalcy. I wish to encourage the public to continue to register the election for vaccine. Continue to register and become fully vaccinated so we as a country can achieve herd immunity, thereby taking us one step closer to moving past the worst of this pandemic and cultivating a much safer Bahamas for us all. Mr. Speaker, even as we roll out vaccines, and continue necessary public health measures. The most important contributing factor for a positive outlook for the Bahamian economy will be our ability to remain agile and adapt to the ever-changing global environment. In 2019, before the pandemic touched Bahamian shores, the Bahamas received more than 5.5 million arrivals by sea. These 5.5 visitors provided a significant resource of revenue for our restaurants, for our tour operators, for our world famous straw market, and for hundreds of Bahamian households. The value of tourism, the delayed reopening of the cruising industry, has undoubtedly presented devastating impacts to many sectors of the Bahamian economy. However, however, as last year's Resilient Bahamas plan predicted, while the COVID-19 pandemic presented a crisis, it has also created opportunities that we could leverage to our advantage. For example, for decades, entrepreneurs in the tourism sector has lamented the limited participation in the tourism sector and the challenge of earning revenues from guests who refused to disembark once cruise ships enter our ports. The recently announced home porting of Crystal Cruises on Royal Caribbean, which will be provisioning the ships in Nassau and Grand Bahama, presents an opportunity never before seen in the Bahamian cruise industry. It provides the opportunity for Bahamians to play a greater role in cruise opportunities by providing services to cruise ships up and down the value chain. With a captive audience of thousands of guests, Bahamian entrepreneurs can supply goods and services to cruise ships and their passengers before, during, and after their journey. And these guests will require food and beverages, tours and excursions, pre- and post departure accommodations, souvenirs and gifts, entertainment 
and myriad other services. The Hemis are well equipped to fill these gaps and exploit these opportunities. Mr. Speaker, the COVID-19 pandemic has encouraged creativity and ingenuity on the part of, of the Hemians through investments in secondary sources of income that have contributed to the strengthened economic pulse of our economy. The resilience played, displayed by Bohemian businesses as they quickly adopted digital solutions to advertise, market, deliver goods and services, and ensure payment for their products has been truly remarkable. As Bohemian entrepreneurs continue to grow, my government will remain steadfast in lending support through vital agencies such as the Bahamas Development Bank and Small Business Development Center, SPDC. Mr. Speaker, I am proud to say that with the many steps taken by my administration to show up our economy, the growth prospects for the Bahamian economy are as boundless and unlimited as the incredible talent of our Bahamian people. Mr. Speaker, with the economic context established, I would like to update this Honorable House on the government's 2020-2021 fiscal performance, nine months and March 2021. As I have reminded members last year, my government presented a budget and plan to this House that was based on the premise of ensuring a robust, immediate response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And this budget provided for expansion of our health and safety measures while also supporting our businesses and maintaining employment, supporting families and ensuring our essential public services continue. This budget, Mr. Speaker, anchored by our resilient Bahamas plan envisaged the modest reopening of the tourism sector of the Bahamian economy in the second quarter of the fiscal year with substantially reduced levels of tax revenue as the world rebounds from the COVID-19 pandemic. The government also determined that notwithstanding the fall off in revenue, it was critical that our plan expanded health care and social assistance spending that it provided increased support for small businesses and that ensured that as many people as possible kept their jobs. The Resilient Bahamas Plan called for the government to do its part to secure the welfare of Bahamian and maintain the core integrity of the Bahamian company. And these critical obligations against a backdrop of significantly reduced revenues translated into a substantial projected fiscal deficit of $1.3 billion or 11.2% of GDP. Mr. Speaker, for the nine months end March 2021, which is the latest published data on government's fiscal performance, I am pleased to report that the government has operated within the parameters of its fiscal targets, notwithstanding the many challenges. Due to the impulse of COVID-19 health and safety measures, and the accompanying economic downturn during the first quarter of fiscal year, which initially had set the government back by nearly $60 million against budget, the increased revenue receipts during the third quarter of the fiscal year has exceeded the budget for that period, thus permitting the government to make up the early budgetary setback. At the end of March, Revenue receipts totaled $1.2 billion, consistent 
with the revenue targets for the first nine months of the fiscal year. Recurrent expenditures widened over the same period last year by $129.6 million to $1.9 billion and equated to 75.4% of the budget. COVID-19 related expenses inflated recurrent expenditure by $180 million for the year to date. For the fiscal year to date, the government has also had to substantially, in, had to substantially increase its support for several state-owned enterprise, SOEs, to permit them to weather the economic downturn caused by the pandemic and to keep their staff fully employed. This has included, Mr. Speaker, $11.2 million in additional assistance to Lucai and Renewal Holdings, $2.6 million assistance to Water and Sewage Corporation, $34.5 million in payroll and operational support for Bahamas Air. Mr. Speaker, while the world was following or laying off individuals, my government, this government, had laid off, not furloughed, any member of the public service. Nor Bahamas Air. We allowed each member of Bahamas Air Public Service and others to maintain their respect and their dignity to continue to support their families and their livelihoods. $4.1 million, Mr. Speaker, in operational support to the airport authority and $4.6 million to Nassau Flight Services. Mr. Speaker, as announced in this honorable house a few short months ago, to offset reductions in revenue, the government sought to continue its important capital expenditure stimulus projects while also eliminating non-essential capital spending. The net result was a contraction in capital spending of 30.1 million to 168.0 million or 32.6% of budget when compared to the prior year. And despite these challenges, 8.7 million was spent to continue restoration efforts from Hurricane Dorian and 3.3 million spent to complete the restoration of the damaged Grand Memorial Hospital in Grand Bahama. As a result of these extraordinary fiscal circumstances, Mr. Speaker, the deficit widened by 626.9 million to 878.2 million over the corresponding period. And this outturn is however consistent with the budgetary plan approved approved by parliament the impact on government borrowing as a result is an expansion of total debt to 9.6 billion or 82.8 percent of gdp as at end march 2021 mr speaker there has been a lot of discussion about the level of government spending and the level of government borrowing this economic, during this economic crisis. Even the opposition who published an almost identical plan last year and who voted for the government's resilient Bahamas plan still are attempting to play petty politics and criticize the very policies and plans they supported and voted for. Nonetheless, Mr. Speaker, as always, my administration is not distracted by idle talk from those who certainly know better. We know that they know that the plan they voted for is, in the, right plan, is the right plan for our current circumstances and that we are a government that has demonstrated the willingness to do the right thing even when it is not always the popular thing. Nonetheless, Mr. Speaker, to provide context, I would like to point out the following to this Honorable House. The Bahamas' direct spending on its COVID-19 response approximate, 
approximates 2.5% of GDP. This level of support is in line with many of our Caribbean neighbors in terms of percent of GDP. While neighboring countries may have only provided unemployment assistance for up to three months, three months, my government made the conscious decision and have committed thus far to extend unemployment assistance for 15 months already to end June 2021. It is also because of the prudent fiscal practices which my government implemented. With reducing the fiscal deficit to, a, to an historic low by 2018-2019 that allowed us the fiscal headroom to be able to finance such an extensive level of support to Bahamian citizens when this crisis arose. It is because this government had already demonstrated its ability to be a competent and credible steward of the fiscal affairs of the country that has allowed us to be in a position to marshal the resources to meet this unprecedented situation. Mr. Speaker, the lesson to be learned from the twin crisis of Hurricane Dorian and COVID-19 pandemic is that had it not been for the fiscal discipline exercised by this administration beforehand, the impact of these disasters would have been far worse. It is for this reason that my government is assured that, that the past steps we have taken were correct and we will commit ourselves to restoring the fiscal health of our country as soon as possible. We will continue to adhere to the tenets and principles of our fiscal responsibility legislation. We will continue to publish our medium-term fiscal plan and our quarterly fiscal performance report. This is the way we do the people's business, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I now turn my attention to providing an outline of the government's Accelerated Bahamas Recovery Plan, or Accelerated Bahamas for short, as indicated earlier, that will guide my administration's fiscal and economic strategic activities for the upcoming fiscal year. The core Accelerated Bahamas is people-centered. It's people-centered. It places a focus on maintaining and supporting families small businesses and communities, and growing our economy. Mr. Speaker, in the wake of Hurricane Dorian and the COVID-19 pandemic, many of our fellow Bahamians have been placed on furlough or lost their jobs entirely. Just last week, we witnessed hundreds of tourism sector workers displaced once again due to the effects of the global pandemic. And Mr. Speaker, nothing hurts my heart more than when I visit close-knit neighbors, neighborhood, New Providence, Grand Bahama, and throughout the family island, and see firsthand the physical, social, and economic devastation experienced by our community. It pains me, Mr. Speaker, to see proud young men and women stripped of the dignity that honest hard work provides for them and their families. It is for this reason that job creation is a primary pillar for auxiliary Bahamas. And this administration has already demonstrated its intent to combat this issue head on through support for employment over the last year. I want to reiterate, Mr. Speaker, that to date, we have provided $44.4 million through the tax credit tax deferral payroll support program, which allowed 126 businesses 
to help pay the salaries for 14,000 private sector employees. 14,000 private sector employees during the height of pandemic-related shutdowns. $20 million for public aviation sector to provide operation and payroll support. Five million to private schools above their budgeted subventions to provide operational and payroll support. Mr. Speaker, as the government continues with its vaccine deployment strategy and the Bahamian and global economy rebounds, our plan is focused on transitioning from unemployment support, as we have been doing, to maintaining and expanding economic opportunities with job growth policies. We are also focusing on providing incentives to small businesses to employ additional staff. These incentives will take the form of several job retention and job growth programs and policies. For businesses, Mr. Speaker, we are launching the government's Employment Incentive Program. Through this new initiative, business will be able to apply for a VAT tax credit to cover the salaries of up to 10 new employees. Ten new employees brought on to their payroll as of the 1st of July. The allowable tax credit will be up to $400 per week per employee. Eligible businesses will have to follow certain compliance rules and must be in good standing with NIB and the tax authorities. We anticipate that up to 250 businesses will take advantage of this opportunity and get up to 2,500 persons back to work. The estimated cost for this investment in job creation will be approximately $40 million in foregone revenue in line with the amounts related to the previous payroll support program. Small and medium-sized businesses have often lamented that startup costs are prohibitive and that big businesses and foreign investors get the kinds of incentives they do not qualify for. We are addressing this concern head on, Mr. Speaker, ensuring that Bahamians have access to startup concessions just as large investment projects do. Now, now. Every Bahamian small business and entrepreneur will be able to apply for and obtain duty concessions on all items needed to start or expand their businesses, including, including on the first stock of inventory. Any Bahamian entrepreneur, any small businesses with an annual turnover of less than $5 million, anywhere in the country, from Inagua to Grand Key to Walker's Key, you will get the same treatment as the mega resort or the large manufacturer. We are leveling the playing field, Mr. Speaker. Increasing opportunities for entrepreneurship and ownership. Mr. Speaker, the Hamans have demonstrated a remarkable level of ingenuity and creativity during this crisis, even though the pandemic has taken a terrible toll on the Bahamian economy. We have seen a large number of businesses emerge during this crisis, and my government has sustained small businesses in several ways. More than 1,000 small businesses were approved 
for loan and grant financing as part of my government's COVID-19 program. This initiative initially administered by the Access Accelerated Small Business Development Center, or SBDC, represented a collective 45 million allocated and dispersed. For businesses in fishing and agriculture sector, duty on all related fishing and agricultural equipment was reduced along with the SBTC providing five million in loan and grant financing to these sectors. More than $800 million was dispersed to 41 applicants as part of the preschool grant program providing access to early childhood education. And Mr. Speaker, during the budget, I'm certain my Minister of Education will give a report on the accomplishments in his ministry, and I would not preempt him on these matters. For businesses in the fishing and agricultural sector, duty on all related fishing and agricultural equipment was reduced along with the SPDC providing five million in loan and grant financing to these sectors. Approximately $1.6 million in grant funding has been provided as part of our standalone grant programs, allowing 164 new and existing businesses a chance to play a greater role in our economy. $1.5 million in equity financing has been provided to small businesses via the Bahamas Entrepreneurial Venture Capital Fund. Mr. Speaker, while these investments in Bahamian entrepreneurship have sustained many small businesses during the worst of the crisis, my government will continue to be bold in its strategy to help small businesses grow. Indeed, as I never tire on saying, no ad other administration in the history of the Bahamas has done as much as we have to support Bahamian entrepreneurs and small businesses. It brings my administration immense pride and joy to be able to say that we have been able to help finance over 1,000 entrepreneurs and small businesses to assist them in starting, expanding, or staying in business during the economic crisis. Mr. Speaker, in this budget, we will continue to provide historic levels of support through unprecedented levels of access to financing opportunities. We are living up to the commitment made to expand the level of small business support, and we will make $250 million financing available to the SPDC over the next five years. The speaker out is $50 million per year. Starting with his first injection of $35 million in this upcoming budget. This means, Mr. Speaker, for retail businesses, vendors in agriculture and fishery sector, vendors in technology sector, more support is on the way. My government also continues, intends to continue to support the Bahamas Development Bank in line with the BDB's recent restructuring and strategic plan. BDB will be provided with capital support in this current debit an additional $4 million in funding. Financing options available for entrepreneurs will also expand implementation of the new crowdfunding regulations, which will allow small and medium-sized businesses that are only being reserved for larger, more mature businesses. Mr. Speaker, am I hearing right? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I am particularly excited at this 
as this opportunity will allow businesses to obtain financing in relatively small amounts from tens of thousands of potential Bahamian investors in a regulated, secure, and simplified structure. Mr. Speaker, it is true that access to financing is vital for the continued growth of our national economy and the success of Bahamian entrepreneurs. However, it is also true that the government must tackle the financial barriers that frustrate and inhibit Bahamian business growth and development on a daily basis. Therefore, our economic and fiscal plan involves the creation of an economic environment in which small businesses can grow and thrive. To help create this enabling environment, it will be critical to follow the recommendations of the Economic Recovery Committee and provide special incentives to improve the viability and prospects for the least developed areas of the country. Accordingly, Mr. Speaker, Auxiliary Bahamas calls for the establishment of a special economic zone targeted at the southern islands of the Bahamas with one notable exception. One. All right, of the island at of the Sandman. Island. You have. <laughs> you. <laughs> this southern island. This southern island. Mr. Speaker. This southern island. <laughs> it is to spur immediate economic activity in these islands and to encourage persons to invest in homes and businesses in these islands. My Michael. Through the provisions of an amended Family Island Development Encouragement Act, residents and businesses on these islands or investing in these islands will qualify for both duty and VAT concessions on the full range of materials they will need to build or renovate a house or to start or expand a business. The qualifying islands. The qualifying islands, Mr. Speaker, includes Ragged Island, San Salvador, San Salvador, Rum Key, Cat Island, Long Island, Meguana. Inagua, Crooked Island, Long Key, and most importantly, Andres. Here we go. Andres, go by Andres. Andres, Mr. Speaker, the largest of the Bahamian Islands. Andres, oh my Andres. Yet the most neglected. The basis of selection focused on these islands where the pace of consistent economic development has been behind that of the rest of the country. The designation as a special economic zone will also provide concessions on business license payable and on real property tax for qualifying individuals. Included in this are concessions and discounts for VAT on conveyances with zero VAT payable by Bahamians on transactions under $500,000 and with discounted VAT for non-Bahamians under the same threshold. These concessions, Mr. Speaker, will last for two years and are intended to be a catalyst for exhilarated economic activity in the Southern Islands by prospective investors. 
as well as Bahamians who may be looking to build or buy a home in those islands, which is the very ambition of Auxiliary Bahamas. Mr. Speaker, the past 18 months have demonstrated to the Bahamian public and to the world at large the importance of having a robust healthcare system. Yes, my Carl. <laughs> Your islands are being declared tax-free. This must be supported by the appropriate social support mechanisms if we want to truly make a difference in the lives of our people, particularly the most vulnerable. It is for this reason, Mr. Speaker, that over the past year, my administration has made substantial investments in health, social support, and COVID-19 support, including the completion of the 21 million phase one redevelopment of the Rand Memorial Hospital in Grand Bahama. The allocation of 17 million for the Department of Social Services food voucher program. The provision of 17.8 million in direct COVID related health expenditure. and the reduction and elimination of duty on essential personal protective equipment needed to combat the viral outbreak. Mr. Speaker, as we move into the next fiscal year, this administration will invest in even more, even more in public health and social welfare system to protect the health and well-being of our nation. Mr. Speaker, while the Bahamas has fared well in the fight against the coronavirus pandemic, this effort is both a sprint and a marathon. It is for this reason that we have allocated $10 million in the upcoming budget to continue the, the fight for the health and safety of Bahamians, the fight to return to a sense of normalcy and an end to the pandemic. This funding will continue to be used to purchase much needed personal protective equipment such as masks, gloves, and gowns and other emergency needs as we combat the ravages of this virus. In terms of capital investment, the shortages of beds facing hospitals, and the need to expand healthcare has not been lost on this administration. While delayed, due to the unprecedented impact of Hurricane Dorian and the COVID-19 virus, demonstrated that we cannot prolong such investments. We are therefore, Mr. Speaker, we are therefore moving swiftly to invest over $100 million in hospital upgrades. With an ex estimated expenditure of over $70 million targeted for the Princess Margaret Hospital. And more than $19 million budgeted for the commencement of the new four-story tower expansion at the Rand Memorial Hospital in Freeport, Rand Bahamas. That will be designed but should you need to go up at some later time, they go up. Both facilities, which are the bedrock of our public health care system, on our two most populated islands, will be upgraded with new modern... Now listen. Listen. I said both facilities, Ron and Princess Margaret, will be upgraded with new, modern, multi-story towers that will house the most cutting-edge equipment, expand their footprint, provide additional bed space, and enhance day-to-day -day operations.
speak, I'm sure all would remember that it was the FNM that had built the critical care block at the Princess Margaret, and it's the intention to now proceed with the other block, which would include maternal and child health care and others of which the Minister of Health will speak about. The funding of the Princess Margaret Tower is coming through a loan agreement with Banco Santander that is guaranteed by the multilateral investment guarantee agency, MICA, of the World Bank. Going through MICA has allowed the government to secure the seven-year loan at a low interest rate of approximately 3.23% per annum. As the loan agreement has recently been concluded, we are presenting the related resolution to Parliament today and the borrowing will be credited this current fiscal year. What I'm basically saying, Mr. Speaker, is the money is already in the bank. Oh. What I'm saying is Ryan Memorial Hospital is a go. <laughs> What I'm also saying is the new tower at the Princess Margaret Hospital with modern facility is a go. Uh -huh. Speaker, this, this means that we have the cash, we have the cash of the central bank in full and in in trust, in trust for the public hospital authority, Grand Memorial and Princess Margaret Hospital. <laughs> this will allow us to pursue the project at an exhilarated pace over the next 18 to 24 months with funding fully secured. As mentioned, Mr. Speaker, you will not see this allocation in the new PMH Tower for the new PMH Tower in the new budget because the funds are being raised this fiscal year by parliamentary approval, but the work will begin and end next fiscal year. We are on the way to a new, ultra-modern, high-tech hospital in Grand Bahama and New Providence. What you will see in the budget is a 19 million allocation for the new tower at the Ryan Memorial Hospital to cover the initial phases of what will ultimately be a 39 million dollar project. The four-story expansion to the newly opened and renovated Ryan Memorial Hospital will ensure that Grand Bahamians will also have the benefit of a world-class modern hospital facility. Learning from the damages to the facility from Hurricane Dorian, we are building back smarter. And this multi-story facility will ensure that should Grand Bahama be impacted by another severe storm, patients can continue to receive the best of care in a new climate resilient facility constructed vertically to withstand flooding. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, we will be investing over 100 million over the next 18 months or so in a massive upgrade of our core medical facilities. And when complete, we will have the equipment, technology, and facilities that will rival any medical center in the region and in the world. Mr. Speaker, we are also weaving in technology in another way, to the benefit of residents all across the archipelago, consistent with our trust toward digitization. The sum, listen up, Pine, Pine Rich. <laughs> the sum of $1 million in capital funding will be allocated to the Department of Transformation and Digitization to implement an innovative telemedicine initiative. Now you would remember that we started telemedicine in, 20, in 2009. 
I was Minister of Health, and we had the program working between Andrew and New Providence. For certain disease entities, individuals from Andrews need not travel to New Providence because they could have been treated while staying in Andrews, and the same as Abaco. You would also note that we had the teleradiology system in place at that time also. And individuals could have gotten x-rays done in Grand Bahama. And because we recognize shortages of staff throughout the Bahamas, the radiologists in New Providence was on call and interpreted the radiological investigation for Grand Bahama. So Grand Bahama and New Providence was one. You would also note that we had at that time technology between Grand Bahama, New Providence, and Florida. So that if we needed a second read, we could have gotten a second opinion with the radiologist in the U.S. But Mr. Speaker, as we lost the program of this market. Oh but we're going to restart. Yes, yes. So, Mr. Speaker, it's Pine Ridge, basically what I'm saying, had we continued along that road, we would have been way ahead of COVID-19 and the world. However, be assured that the Minister of Health will speak about it because he's already put in place in the operating theater at the Rand Memorial Hospital, which we've had, Princess Margaret, so that if while a surgeon is operating, if he runs into difficulty that he don't understand, he can have a second opinion from the U.S. or wherever he may choose, who would also be involved with the surgery and guide him or her through the procedure without, as we did in the past, once we ran into difficulty, problems we did not understand, we closed individuals, woke them up, kept them stable, and transported them to another facility in the U.S. where they were reopened <coughs> and operated again. What the minister will tell you, that is an issue of the past. We need it. They were all in place but this matter. But he will take it even further, and he will speak to that, not I. No longer will people living in Long Island, Inagua, Mangrove Key, or any other settlement have to fly to New Providence or Grand Bahama to incur large travel costs to access health care comparable to what can be found in the capital. This House, Mr. Speaker, will be updated on this initiative as digital transformation IT and health professionals advance this initiative together. Mr. Speaker, in terms of health equity, this administration does not believe that socioeconomic class or income should be a barrier to accessing quality health care services. Do you agree with that, Prime Minister? Without the ability to access quality health care, we risk allowing the deepening of health disparities and increasing our vulnerability should another global pandemic emerge. With this in mind, we are also proud to announce the significant advancement made by the National Health Insurance Program. NHI Bahamas expects to see sustained growth in the enrollment of beneficiaries and technological advancement as the program continues to evolve with the ongoing implementation of the primary care Transformation Initiative. The Primary Care Transformation Initiative will provide a standardized package of primary care to all Bahamians while improving the quality of care being delivered. Put simply, as we foreshadowed last year, we are implementing the plan that will allow all Bahamians to have access to high quality primary care, whether at public facility or private facility. In this expanded NHI program, you will be able to select a private family doctor and obtain a full range of primary care services. Mr. Speaker, 
accelerate Bahamas, both increases access to health care while it radically improves our health care facilities. Our plan recognizes that the key to sustained and robust growth and development is the assurance that our people can get world-class health care when they need it. Mr. Speaker, as the global economy begins to rebound, the Bahamian tourism industry is poised to emerge from its forced hibernation. As the sector begins to awaken, awaken my administration is not content to take a hands-off approach on its revival. As our number one industry, tourism is too important to be left on its own without any direction. Instead, we have formulated a sector strategy to drive its growth designed around protecting citizens and visitors through the implementation of clear health and safety protocols, taking advantage of new home porting opportunities, increasing SME participation across the tourism value chain and ramping up our tourism, our tourism market activities to attract a diverse market. Initially, the Ministry of Tourism aimed to facilitate the identification and adoption of relevant health and safety protocols and requirements to protect both visitors and tourism workers. The development of Bahamas Tourism Readiness and Recovery Plan, followed by delivery of training in the protocols of the wider tourism stakeholders, was imperative to ensure all tourism sector stakeholders were secure in their ability to operate safely and effectively as soon as our borders were fully reopened. And these protocols will continue to be enforced through the Clean and Pristine Certification Program, which ensures that all entities follow the mandated health and safety protocols. The Ministry has also implemented the Bahamas Travel Health Visa System through a new dedicated unit of the Ministry to support the country's implementation of its COVID-related guidelines for safely managing international travels, both foreign and local, as well as inter-island travel. And this process also required COVID travel insurance for foreign visitors to protect against the risk of overburdening the local health system in the event of an infection. It is expected, Mr. Speaker, that the health visa system will continue to operate throughout the recovery of the tourism sector to support the maintenance of traveler compliance and requirements for travel change over time. Likewise, training for tourism participants is expected to remain a necessity as health and safety protocols and requirements shift in response to the pandemic. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Tourism is supporting a more diversified approach that engages more small ships and premium luxury lines, especially for sailings to lesser traffic locations in the family islands. In this regard, the initiation of home porting and Bahamas-centered itineraries supports both the early restart of cruise activity and its expansion throughout the islands, as well as growth of linkages for small supply chain development within the country. Based on research by the Flora, Florida Caribbean Cruise Association, in some cases there have been a 45% increase in spend when countries engage in home porting. The Bahamas is poised to take advantage of this, of this opportunity to boost, boost visitor spend and government is committed to doing everything it can to make this long awaited dream a reality. The Ministry of Tourism, boy, I can be late to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> the Ministry of Tourism will also continue to monitor and identify the emergent trends in traveler interest and demand among key stopover traveler segments, including younger travelers, families, and uh, meeting incentives, conferences, and events market. We are positioning ourselves to take advantage of the diversification of the tourism product to address the shifting interests and priorities of visitors, including 
for ecological and cultural experiences and lower density locales, especially smaller properties and family island settings. This will guide our marketing approach and our industry facilitation activities going forward. As the world begins to emerge and recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, consumer sentiment around travel is far more positive than it was in 2020. I am advised that there is incredible pent-up demand for travel and consumers are feeling increasingly op optimistic and confident as cases decline and access to vaccines increases. We have worked hard to place ourselves in the position to reassure travelers who continue to have a heightened concern for health and safety. The comprehensive COVID-19 response plan for destination marketing has been combined with the country's streamlined travel protocols to enable the Bahamas to rebuild traveler confidence that seamless that a seamless and safe vacation is again within their reach. As a data-driven organization, I have been assured that the Ministry of Tourism will continue to stay ahead of the numbers to drive agile and cutting-edge marketing campaigns based on real-time booking reports. Mr. Speaker, using big data analytics to reinforce marketing decisions through the use of numerous data sources have been integrated in the ministry's marketing strategy to ensure the best outcomes and a return on our investment in global marketing. Going forward, the Ministry of Tourism will prioritize a more holistic strategic approach to improving tourism resilience and sustainability. We are increasing attention to tourism product diversification and industry facilitation, especially where it supports improved entrepreneurial opportunities for Bahamians. As such, we are supporting economic diversification through tourism and encouraging improved Bahamian participation in tourism supply chain and tourism ownership. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry's strategic destination marketing and management efforts have positioned our industry for success as we move toward full reopening. The comprehensive COVID-19 response for global communications has reassured future visitors that they can enjoy their travels throughout our islands with peace of mind that the health and safety of visitors and residents have been and will continue to remain a top priority. In order to bring back tourism, staying the course will remain important as current protocols continue to prove successful in minimizing the spread and instilling travelers, traveler confidence. With vaccine distribution ramping up, both the Bahamas and abroad, major hotels reopening and the return of cruising in the Bahamas on the horizon, there is steadfast optimism that the tourism industry will return to profitability sooner rather than later. Through creative partnership and exciting virtual experiences, the Ministry will ensure that the Bahamas stays in the headlines in the coming months and is top of the mind for consumers as they begin planning their first post-COVID vacation. We will also work with industry stakeholders to deliver a better quality of tourism experience for our price point and to increase the overall profitability of tourism for Bahamians, which is key to the future sustainability and resilience of tourism. Speaker, more detail and the way forward would be given by the Minister of Tourism. I want to speak now, Mr. Speaker, about public and private sector investment, improving the framework for domestic and quality foreign direct investment. Mr. Speaker, history tells us that investment spending, both public and private, has an important role to mitigate against the impact of economic downturns, as well as to lay the foundation for a general economic growth. The importance of this investment spending is even more pronounced today in the midst of a global economic contraction as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And my administration recognizes that critical domestic and foreign direct investment can help turn the economic tide 
and that is why this administration has made substantial investment in the past fiscal year to prepare for the eventual rebound. We purchased the Grand Bahama International Airport for one dollar. Pre-Dorian. This airport brought 75,000 visitors to Grand Bahama who spent more than 140 million on the island over the course of the year. Work will begin shortly to build a world-class airport and add to the international gateway across the country. Other investments include, included groundbreaking of a new 60 million international airport in Exuma, paving of 10 miles of roadway in Exuma, roads which were last upgraded some 15 years ago, reconstruction of the 260-foot Little Abaco Bridge, which is scheduled for completion in summer 2021. Completion of the Rock Sound Dock. Completion of the 9 million Standard Creek, Standard Creek Bridge in Central Andres. Works underway on Ragged Island, multi-purpose government complex. Works underway for the South Andres Gymnasium. Mr. Speaker, at this pivotal moment in Bahamian history, we require re unique and creative approaches to public and private investment to restore our economic health and provide opportunities for employment and growth. In this budget, my government has committed to funding $31 million in renewable and resilient energy projects, $4 million for phase two of the Ragged Island Multipurpose Center, $2 million to restore Ragged Island Clinic, $1.5 million to restore our Ragged Island Police Station, $200,000 to repair the Marsh Harbor International Airport, $1.7 million to repair the Treasure Key Airport, $5 million to support the North Elutra Airport PPP project. $5 million to support phase two of Exuma International Airport. $4 million to repair and install proper drainage Bel Air area of Pinewood Gardens. $3.3 million for Inagua Comprehensive School and $1.9 million for East Grand Bahama Comprehensive School. As we look to the future of national infrastructure development, my administration will pursue credible opportunities to create alternative means of funding these public sector investments. I am pleased to announce, Mr. Speaker, that work is quickly advancing on the creation of a national infrastructure fund to provide a comprehensive, innovative solution to funding public investment. With the assistance of the IDB, we are quickly advancing the process of putting the legal financial measures in place which will create a master infrastructure fund with industry-specific sub-funds. By creating this new funding mechanism, we shall be able to mobilize hundreds of millions of dollars in private sector capital to support critical infrastructure development throughout the country in a transparent and accountable manner. We will soon bring necessary legislation and supporting documents to this House as we move to swiftly make this a reality. As the government do, does its part to invest in the critical infrastructure of the nation as a means to create economic stimulus, this administration has sought to develop creative policies to ensure that Bahamians are poised to make investments of their own. Mr. Speaker, I would also like to update this Honorable House on one of the most significant prospective changes in the Bahamas' national investment framework in 20 in the 20 years i am pleased to advise the house that the government has begun has begun work on the invest bahamas project with bids having been received for the firm that will assist in the establishment of this new investment regime for the country under this new framework the bahamas will have a new investment agency with broader powers to process applications for quality 
domestic and foreign direct investment. The new Invest Bahamas Agency will have a clear mandate to attract investment to specific sectors through global marketing and public relations. The Bahamas will no longer be reactive in its approach to attracting investments from abroad. The new approach involves us seeking out domestic and foreign investors in sectors where we see growth opportunities. As I have said throughout the course of delivering this budget communication, we are focused on creating a level playing field for Bahamians. The public can expect that we will also revise the concessions and incentives offered to both Bahamians and foreign investors with a view to diversifying the economy and ensuring the domestic and foreign investment processes are equitable. Implementing this new framework will necessarily involve introducing a digital risk-based approach to investment and investor approval. While the rules are still being finalized, the process will call for delegated authorities to the Invest Bahamas to approve applications based on specified and established criteria, with only the most significant and complex of applications needing to seek the approval from National Economic Council. Under this revised framework, we will place the country on a much more competitive footing and reduce the unnecessary bureaucracy faced by Bahamian and foreign investors seeking to make beneficial investments. These efforts, Mr. Speaker, will accelerate productive investment allowing us to meet our ambition of a robust and sustained economy. Mr. Speaker, since coming to office, my administration has consistently focused on the adoption and integration of information and communication technology as a means to enhance government service delivery and accessibility. Broad digital transformation is at the core of this administration's commitment to not only make public services more efficient, but to also make these services accessible to everyone, whether at home or abroad, in New Providence or on a family island. The need for greater accessibility has become all too apparent over the past year, where the movement of citizens and residents has necessarily been limited on the advice of public health experts. But over the past year, the government has launched a myriad of new online services, namely the introduction of e-learning solutions by the Ministry of Education during the worst of the pandemic. And this effort was supported with the compassionate outpouring of support by the private sector, citizens and civil society who came together to supply thousands of devices to students, ensuring many of our most vulnerable children have access to education, even if they could not be in a classroom. Both magistrates' courts and the industrial tribunal implemented digital solutions to not only ensure convenient payment of court fees, but that justice can continue uninterrupted, even if calls of justice are temporarily closed. Since the launch of my gateway platform, over 6,900 people have registered for the platform with approximately 2,400 driver's licenses, police certificates, marriage, death, birth certificates, and other government documents issued to date. The cabinet, including myself, has also made a shift to a digital environment via e-cabinet. Most recently, the public saw the results of efforts to digitize the Department of Social Services with the launch of its digital social protection and management information system portal called COMIS. And this program allows citizens in need of social assistance to complete all steps, including application, eligibility, identification, and disbursement of funds, and then for the completion of auditing online. This platform allows beneficiaries to access 15 web-based services in one location. Mr. Speaker, I would like to impress upon the public that our accelerated Bahamas recovery plan was designed with careful thought and detailed analysis. As we speak to the need for increased digitization of government processes and services, 
We are also providing the means for the general public to work alongside us to do the same in the private sector. In the Exhilarated Bahamas Recovery Plan, the public will benefit from elimination of duty on digital transformation hardware, software, and services to aid in the digital transformation of the Bahamian economy. They'll benefit with the increased use of technology to deliver government services. The government has entered into agreement with several third-party payment solution providers, and these providers have aided in the delivery of services while freeing up government resources. Efficiencies have, have been experienced to date in immigration, customs, ports, and NIB facilitated unemployment assistance payments. As the electronic delivery of such services continues to expand, we intend to make use of more of the vendors. I encourage all entrepreneurs to take advantage of these new conveniences for more efficient day-to-day -day business operations and to take part in the Bahamian Digital Revolution. We are amending the, re the legislation to allow for third-party receivers of government revenue, some of which will be done online and for the digitization of the forms, receipts, and applications required by customs and other authorities. These will all make it easier for residents and businesses alike to do business with the government. The Bayman public will see the continued expansion of the My Gateway platform, which will offer more than 40 government services online by December 2021, allowing for digital license issuance and improving access to a wide array of services. Improving it, Mr. Speaker, to stimulate economic growth, Accelerate Bahamas proposes an expansion of the existing concessions regime. This will necessarily mean that while we expect economic growth, economic activity to increase, government revenues will likewise decrease. To counter this reduction in revenues, and in line with my administration's four-year record of fiscal prudence, we are also proposing new and enhanced revenue measures that will allow us to meet the medium-term objectives as set out in our fiscal strategy for it as the economy rebound over time, over time. I would like to remind this honorable house and the public that it was this administration who introduced fiscal responsibility legislation. And more importantly, that it was this government that made the commitment to fiscal discipline backed by unparalleled levels of transparency. It is because we took this prudent approach that we were able to bring down the deficit and correct the gross mismanagement of previous administrations. As we were Correcting those years of mismanagement, we also took on the responsibility of paying off the more than $400 million in bills that was left behind in the Treasury. As of present, the prevailing circumstances have compelled us with the concurrence of the opposition and expert economists here and abroad to invoke the the Exceptional Circumstances Clause of the Fiscal Responsibility Act and permit short-term deviations from the path to fiscal consolidation and to run higher deficits than would be undertaken during normal times. Mr. Speaker, I do not want the House to forget that prior to Dorian, it was this administration that brought down the deficit to its low point in 10 years. while paying off hundreds of millions of dollars in bills left by its former administration. While we are on our way to achieving fiscal consolidation and a balanced budget, the country was hit with not just one, but two unprecedented economic calamities, and all within an eight-month period. Because of these circumstances and the core responsibility of my administration, to do what is necessary to, 
to, fill, to first protect and secure lives, and second, to do what is necessary to preserve the economy and the value of the Bahamian currency and assets. This government undertook to relax its medium-term fiscal targets and obtain the fiscal resources necessary to ensure stability in our domestic situation. Bahamian economists and international commentators, including IMF in its 2020 Article 4 consultation of the Bahamas, all agreed that extraordinary fiscal measures were and are the right policy tools under these exceptional and difficult circumstances. However, Mr. Speaker, while we have ramped up our borrowings as a near-term response to these crises, we have not and will not abandon our commitment to fiscal discipline and prudent macroeconomic strategies. We have revised our medium-term fiscal strategy and published the same in December of 2020. It sets out our fiscal plans and targets for the next five years. The fiscal strategy was laid in the House and published online for the world to see. It shows that as a responsible government, we will return to fiscal consolidation and reduce deficits, deficits and debt as our economy stabilizes and growth resumes. Unlike our predecessors, we articulate our fiscal plans and we execute them and report on the results. The budget for fiscal year 2021-2022 will remain in line with the fiscal targets established in the fiscal strategy report. Mr. Speaker, as we proceed in the new fiscal year, my administration intends to maintain a focus on improving revenue administration and restoring the country's fiscal health through strengthening the collection of existing taxes and improving tax policy. Perhaps most importantly, this budget goes a long way to ensure a more equitable application of government taxation with a focus on identifying new areas of revenue generation. Mr. Speaker, indeed a hallmark of this budget is to set the stage for greater equity in government taxation. This means taking steps towards standardizing taxation in such a way that all parties pay their fair share and that all businesses can compete on a level playing field. My administration has made several statements regarding the untapped potential of the vacation home market and the millions of tax dollars that go uncollected each year. We are amending the law to clarify that all vacation home marketplaces such as Airbnb and DRBO are required to pay VAT on rentals and commissions. Those marketplaces who are charging VAT presently have interpreted the legislation as being only applicable to the commissions paid out. The clarification in the law will make it explicit VAT will be applicable on the full value of the rental. Mr. Speaker, our plan proposes several amendments and clarifications in respect to tax law and tax policy that will provide incremental revenues for the government. By amending the requirements from the vacation home rental market as mentioned, we estimate 31 million in increased government re revenue. We are increasing the VAT on, re on reality transactions for that portion of a real estate transactions over $2 million. Presently, all transactions over 100,000 are subject to 10% VAT. With the amendment, any portion of a transaction that is over 2 million will be charged at the full VAT rate of 12%. We anticipate this adjustment will yield an additional $4 million. We are introducing legislative amendments to improve real property tax collection, collections for commercial properties. We have had situations where owners of significant commercial properties collect substantial rent from businesses but are delinquent in the payment of taxes. The legislative enhancements will permit the government to have those, rental, those rents paid to the Department of Inland Revenue for delinquent commercial property tax owners. 
We are also including a new provision in the VAT legislation which requires a property owner to inform the DIR when they are shifting the use of their own occupied home into a residential or commercial rental property. This will ensure that these buildings are properly classified. With the assistance of the US-based company Tyler Technologies, the DIR has already completed the first phase of the upgrades to the real property tax roll. The first comprehensive updates of this scope and scale to the property tax roll. This has added some 14,000 properties to the roll and increased the value of taxable properties by $9 billion. This will translate into some anticipated $14 million in increased real property tax revenue. We are increasing the excise ta tax on sherwoods and cigarillos to bring them in line with the convention, convention cigars. We are also amending the VAT Act to assist businesses who tend to remain in a, bitch in a habitual credit position with the DIR Due, you take the Due to the nature of their businesses, we are codifying provisions that up to now had just been bath rules and which permit appropriate accounting treatments to be used to address bad liabilities without putting businesses in an unsustainable cash flow deficit. This will avoid the situation where some groups of businesses have put out substantial amounts of cash even when they are in a credit position only to have to wait for a refund from the DIR. Mr. Speaker, these measures will yield an incremental gain of just over $50 million in revenue for fiscal year 2020-2021. They are very specific, specific and they are targeted. They are designed with the notion of fairness and equity in mind. The reason the government took the decision to pursue incremental gains in revenue is very simple. Auxiliary Bahamas requires targeted tax concessions and relief to spur entrepreneur entrepreneurship and economic activity in the underdeveloped islands of our archipelago as part of our stated goal of accelerating economic activity. To do so in a responsible way, in line with our fiscal targets, we are ensuring that the tax concessions and tax relief measures we are announcing do not take the deficit outside of parameters established in the government fiscal strategy report. Mr. Speaker, the House would recall that recently my administration completed the agreement to take control of our sovereign airspace. Yes. This will mean somewhere between 25 and 30 million dollars per year for utilization in the civil aviation section. While the airspace agreement does not place revenue directly in the government's hands, or in the consolidated fund. The revenues derived will offset the cost to operate the Civil Aviation Authority and related agencies in that sector. This has permitted the government to reduce allocation to those entities as reflected in the budget. Mr. Speaker, in line with the recommendation of the Economic Recovery Committee, we are also undertaking critical reviews of our tax administration policies and overall expenditures. Our aim is to have equity and fairness in taxes and efficiency and impact in expenditures. Accordingly, the Ministry of Finance is undertaking two very important exercises to guide fiscal policy over the median. One, with the assistance of our multilateral partners, we shall undertake a comprehensive diagnostic exercise in respect to tax policy and tax administration. This study will examine the government's current resource, current sources of taxation, revenue trends, and will explore issues such as equity and efficiency in our tax practices. 
of the completion of this exercise, we intend to publish the findings in a white paper to garner feedback from key stakeholders and the general public on how the government should proceed with our ongoing tax reform efforts. We plan to complete the public expenditure review, which has already commenced with the support of the IDB. The goal of this study is to identify areas where there are low efficiencies, duplication, or other areas where the government can reduce, reduce spending to close the gap between revenue and expenditure. We are moving toward we are moving towards a system where we will no longer have to pay for the same service multiple times while the public receives limited benefits. Ultimately, Mr. Speaker, the study will provide a planning framework for achieving a more targeted and efficient management of total expenditure from year to year. Mr. Speaker, Accelerate Bahamas Winding down. Is a comprehensive plan designed to do just as the name says. It has been designed to accelerate the economic recovery and rebound of the Bahamas that is already underway. In addition to this comprehensive plan, this budget also presents additional incentives and concessions to ease the lives of the Bahamians. Some of these measures include the following. Elimination of fat on baby and adult diapers as well as sanitary pads and tampons for women. Elimination of duty on disinfectants in support of efforts to maintain hygiene and sanitation. Elimination of duty by application for construction and repairs to churches and other buildings used for religious gathering. Elimination of duty on a range of sporting equipment and apparatus to encourage exercise and fitness. Elimination of duty on a number of IT related hardware and cabling to support private sector digitization efforts. Reduction in duty on a number of building supplies to 20% and 25% respectively to encourage construction activity. Most notably, Mr. Speaker, this includes the reduction in duty on electrical wire to 20% and continues the reduction duties on construction related items that we began last year. To encourage the growth and development of this promising niche sector, microbreweries have been defined in the law and will benefit from a reduction in the excise tax rate from $5 per gallon to $2 per gallon. They will also be able to sell their products outside of their premises. Products from microbreweries are high value collector's items and will promote job creation and export revenue. That's right. You know, um, That's right. the, the, the inner city Sanan, yeah. the inner city is a perfect example. We declared the inner city a tax-free zone, brought taxes down. They took advantage of 2.5 million of the concession. 46 and 49 individuals were given grants of $122,000. Forty-nine individuals became entrepreneurs and was able to create 146 jobs. In addition to that, those individuals in a tax-free zone was able to increase revenue by $4.8 million. So 
what that what that proves what that proves is you reduce taxes you increase revenue and you increase employment yeah. the inner city is a perfect example mr speaker i have your shirt <laughs> Brett's been wearing it from the last time. Mr. Speaker. Tell him you've been wearing it from the last time. <laughs> but I'm sure the, um, the member for the end time, the Speaker, brother. Mr. Speaker, we appreciate that the reconstruction efforts in Abaco and Grand Bahama are continuing apace and that progress has been limited in labor shortages and even supply shortages as typical supply chain operations have been disrupted because of the pandemic. To continue to support the reconstruction efforts in Abaco and Grand Bahama, we are extending the current relief order known as the SERS SERZ order to the end of December 2021. Thank you. This order provides tax relief for full suite of construction related supplies and activities and it will go a long way in supporting the full restoration of the impacted communities. I am also pleased to advise that for the communities of Abaco and Grand Bahama, we are, for a period of two years, eliminating the VAT on conveyance for properties under 250000 for Bahamians. To bring out the middle class. I reached there, yeah. <laughs> to encourage persons to invest in buying properties and homes in these islands. Foreign buyers under the same threshold will get a discounted VAT rate. Again, Mr. Speaker, under the Auxiliary Bahamas Plan, we want to incentivize persons to move with urgency with the investment plan. Not only will this spur commercial activity, it will make these transactions more affordable by ordinary behemoths. Mr. Speaker, legislation is being amended to allow individuals and businesses to gift land to religious entities, educational institutions, civil organizations, and other entities that are registered as non-profit organizations free of VAT on such conveyances. Presently, only transfers from one nonprofit to another are tax free. Moving forward, any gift of real estate to these organizations from an individual or company also will not attract any taxes on conveyance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I do move that the business of this house continues beyond 1 p.m. today. Honorable members, it has been moved and seconded that the business of this house extend beyond the 1 p.m. hour. As many members that are in favor will remain seated, those who oppose will stand. The business of this house will extend beyond the 1 p.m. hour. Chair recognizes the honorable member for Kalani. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate that break. I've now been energized. <laughs> the caveat will be that the receiving nonprofit organization will have to continue to use it for its social or civil civic or objectives and will not be able to sell it for a period of 10 years. There are other minor amendments being put forward to deal largely with the cleanup or clarification of existing legislation or to give effect to marginal operational changes. These will be addressed during the course of the budget debate. Mr. Speaker, moving from the restoration to growth as the accelerative, accelerated Bahamas recovery plan suggests is the heart of this year's budget. As I mentioned earlier, this plan and the entire budget by extension is designed to continue to provide support to families 
and businesses most in need in the immediate term and to accelerate the recovery of the Bahamian economy. I want to reiterate that in December of last year, the government invoked the Exceptional Circumstances Clause 13 of the Fiscal Responsibility Act 2018, which allowed for a temporary departure from the agreed fiscal targets given the twin impact of Hurricane Dorian and COVID-19 pandemic. It was detailed in the 2020 Fiscal Strategy Report that the current circumstances would translate into a two-year delay in the achievement of the target debt to GDP ratio of 50%. The adjusted date is now fiscal year 2030-31. It is for this reason that the 2020 fiscal strategy proposed a new path to achieve our fiscal targets. While the deficits proposed in the current budget remain at very elevated levels, they are necessary to sustain the economy and set the stage for the impending economic rebound. Further, the deficit remains in line with the fiscal strategy plan published in the 2020 fiscal strategy report. Mr. Speaker, extraordinary times call for an extraordinary response. Unprecedented economic calamities must be met with unprecedented fiscal policy initiatives. And this administration makes no apologies for doing what is necessary and doing what is right to support Bahamians and the Bahamian economy under these most challenging of circumstances. But it bears to repeat, my administration is not a party of fiscal recklessness. We have taken a temporary but necessary detour from fiscal consolidation. As the economy stabilizes in the coming years, we will return to the path of reduced deficits and public debt. Mr. Speaker, while we would have hoped that the impact of the coronavirus would have dissipated at a faster rate, we have faced with the reality of a more protracted pace for global recovery and particularly recovery of the global tourism industry. Nevertheless, with signs pointing to a global rebound in fiscal year 2021-22 and with the revenue measures announced earlier, total government revenues are projected at 2.247 billion dollars, representing an increase of 588.3 million, or 35.5 percent over the projected fiscal year 2020-2021 total revenue. Despite this improvement, revenues are projected to remain 7.5 percent below the 2.426 billion posted in fiscal year 2018. 2019, reflecting the fact that our economy will not likely return to full capacity during the upcoming fiscal year. Mr. Speaker, as we examine projected government expenditure, I will remind the House that during the current fiscal year, the government has provided approximately $194.9 million in direct COVID-related support for the nine months ending March 2020, 2022. While we anticipate a reduced need for the support as the economy rebounds, the current budget still anticipates some 100 million in direct COVID-related support in the form of food assistance, unemployment assistance, health sector support, as well as the revenue foregone on the government's employment incentive program and other growth initiatives. Given the substantial increase in financial financing required during the current fiscal year and the anticipated financing for the new fiscal period, debt servicing charges have increased over 100 million from the prior period. 
Mr. Speaker, our fiscal strategy plan did call for the gradual reduction of interventions to the state-owned enterprises as they moved toward greater self-sufficiency and cost recovery. However, this element of the plan has been deferred for this year due to the effects of the pandemic on the customary revenue flows of these entities. The outlays to those state-owned enterprises in the aviation sector have this year far exceeded their allocation. Despite some return to normalcy, the allocations to Bahamas Air, water and sewage to NASA flight services will be higher than typical years as cash flow slowly returns to normal. The increased allocation to NHI is in line with a key pillar of auxiliary Bahamas to improve access to healthcare by supporting more increased sign-ups for NHI and allowing greater access for us by our citizens to public and private primary care. During the debate, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Health will explain how this approach will revolutionize the delivery of health care and lower unit costs over time by placing the power of choice in the hands of consumers. Speaker, the government will continue to manage employee head count very judiciously, notwithstanding the uniformed branches are being are seeing a number of staff members reach mandatory retirement age, which is leading to an unsustainable fall off in manpower. We have made modest provisions for small classes of new recruits in several of the uniformed branches and in certain key areas for agencies. As our agencies are moving to new digitized environments and processes, we do require more young talent who are tech savvy. Therefore, we are earmarking $1.5 million to enlist up to 75 new college recruits aged 18 to 30 throughout the public service to provide us that critical infusion of new thinking and new ideas. Speaker, this is not new. The government had initiated a policy where we went down and interviewed graduating class at UB and we had recruited three of the top students in economics and they were hired at the um, Ministry of Finance and they were subsequently sent off for further training to obtain their master's degree in economics and I'm happy to report that these three individuals will be returning soon, two in July and one in November. So this is a continuous program. We continue to have a number of unresolved salary adjustment matters involving certain reclassified public servants or groups of public servants that have obtained approval for new career paths. We have made provisions to address many of these long-standing issues. Mr. Speaker, members reviewing the budget document will note that there are no budgetary allocations listed under Head 24, the Department of Statistics, for the upcoming fiscal year and beyond. This is because that department will become the National Statistics Institute as mandated by the new Modern Statistics Act 2022 that comes into effect on July 1st of this year. And the funding for that new institute has been placed in the Ministry of Finance. Sufficient resources have been allocated to allow the new institute to operate and to complete the national, consensus, national census that are being delayed because of the pandemic. Mr. Speaker, as a result of the measures outlined in this budget, recurrent expenditures estimated at 2.83 billion, an increase of 270.1 million, or a 
10.6% increase over the projected spend for fiscal year 2020-2021. Mr. Speaker, as already being detailed, for the upcoming fiscal year, the government will focus on several critical infrastructure and capital projects that are underway, uh, underway and that are critical for supporting Accelerate Bahamas. If we, to, if we are to have an accelerated economy, we must continue the investment in infrastructure that will undergird economic development and commerce and provide necessary economic stimulus. We are projecting some $372.4 million in capital outlays in the upcoming fiscal year. While this is below the $515.5 million budgeted last year, it represents an increase over the budget projected $200 million in actual capital expenditure for this fiscal year. throughout the entire Bahamas. Outside of what has already been mentioned in this presentation, Mr. Speaker, the capital budget will make provisions for the following. Ms. Junkanoo, young men called me, what we doing for them, so I know they must be listening now, so I know JJ is <laughs> locked on the phone. So. Two million to support the Junkanoo community in their development plans for permanent headquarters. And this will be supplemented with provisions of crowned, crown land to the major established Junkanoo groups and with grants from BTC Feeder Trust that were set up for social, cultural, and civic endeavors such as this. Mr. Speaker, I want to remind that as when we get to the budget. Five million to support the infrastructure build out of the government service service lots initiative in Prospect Ridge, Carmichael, and eventually throughout the Bahamas. Mr. Speaker, the type of subdivisions that were commencing in the Prospect Ridge West area for young professionals will be done throughout the Bahamas. We've ident already identified projects in South Lutra. We've identified properties in Exuma. And we're looking to identify property as is necessary. 16 million to support the public-private partnership initiatives that are facilitating the construction of new airports in Exuma North Lutra and Long Island, and that will assist with material renovations to other airports. 7.5 million to the digitization projects of the Ministry of Education, aimed at ensuring that all students everywhere in the Bahamas have access to the digital tools necessary for modern education. 6 million to up for upgrades to the IT infrastructure in the healthcare sector to transform the delivery of health care. Three million to continue support for food security programs of the Ministry of Agri Agriculture as it pursues new and innovative approaches to expand domestic food production. The details of the full range of programs and projects that comprise the government's capital plan will be presented by the respective ministers during the budget. What that means is speaker properties that were identified in the West at 40 and 50,000, yet with 150,000 to 225,000, will likewise be done in Africa, Grand Bahama, and other places. And because, because of 
because Abaco and Grand Bahama had suffered such economic impact, not only of Dorian, but previously, whatever the cost projection is, Grand Bahama and Abaco will incur an additional 50% discount on the already discounted cost. Mr. Speaker, as a result of these revenue and expenditure developments, the fiscal deficit is estimated to come in at 951.8 million or 7.7% of GDP. This is entirely in line with our published fiscal strategy plan, which projected a deficit of 954 million for the upcoming fiscal year. It is also down from the 1.33 billion deficit projected for this year, reflecting the additional revenue measures and an economy that is slowly emerging from this crisis. The major portion of this deficit will be funded through external sources, including an anticipated bond offer and ongoing, and ongoing operations with our multilateral partners. The House will note that we are pursuing an opportunity with one of our key multilateral partners to help support the potential bond offering through a guarantee which should secure interest cost savings for the government. Speaker, responding to the twin calamities of Dorian and COVID-19 pandemics has significantly elevated our country's debt as we have seen, as we have been compelled to mount a response equal to the challenge. We do not gloss over this fact or seek to avoid our responsibilities as stewards of the people's money. Our commitment to pursuing prudence in public debt operation was clearly evident in the recently enacted Public Debt Management Act 2021 that comes into effect on July 1st this year. Section 12 of this act would require my government and all future governments to prepare, publish, and update a debt management strategy each November that will detail how the government is managing its immediate and medium-term liabilities. It bears repeating that a, care, a key pillar of auxiliary Bahamas is fiscal responsibility. Therefore, although we have elevated deficits in the near term to address the crisis they are being undertaken within the context of a medium and long-term debt strategy that will be published later this year, and this strategy will reflect the government's overarching debt management objective to ensure that our financing needs and payment obligations are met in a timely manner at the lowest possible cost and consistent with a prudent degree of risk and that we promote development and efficient functioning of the government's domestic securities market. Sinking funds will also continue to be a key component of the government's debt management strategy. While conditions did not allow for the budgeted contributions to the various sinking funds during this fiscal year, as at end March 2020 stood at $195.4 to settle external bonds, the 15.3 million to settle domestic commitments, the government has budgeted increased future payments over the next three years to compensate for this. Mr. Speaker, my administration is one that takes its job seriously. We are a government that develops plans and strategies and executes them. So when the idle and indolent commentators come forward for getting their own history and their responsibility, we can tell them that not only do we have a plan and strategy, but we were the government that had put in place the laws that required the plan to be published. We are the government that has built up credibility to navigate the most turbulent of economic waters. Mr. Speaker, as I move to complete my remarks, I would like to remind this Honorable House of the theme for the most recent budget contribution from crisis to opportunity. 
During the past year, faced with unprecedented challenges, the Bahamian government supported families, households, communities, and businesses in not only keeping the economy afloat, but in also planting the seeds and preparing us to take advantage of opportunities as we emerge from this global economic downturn. The Bahamas, like many other nations around the world, both near and far, place priority on protecting and maintaining life and livelihood during this precarious time. And will continue to do so as long as is necessary. But in doing so, we must also realize that the current state cannot last forever. And we must begin to prepare for the future. I am confident, Mr. Speaker, that today's budget does just that. Earlier today, I thank the Bahamian people for their indomitable spirit, for their compassion and their resilience during the worst of this pandemic. Mm -hmm. It is that positive spirit that will continue to see us through. I would also like to remind the Bahamian people that once we are true, the same resilience and industrious spirit will be needed to help expand the economy. And when faced with difficult challenges, when we are faced with unprecedented hard times, we do not flinch. We do not power, but lift up our heads to the rising sun and rise to meet every challenge. This government and this country have faced the most devastating storm in our history. But we are still standing. We have faced the most devastating health crisis in our lifetime. But we are still standing. We will keep on standing. We will keep on walking. <laughs> And we will keep on rising, together as a people and together as a nation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and may God continue to bless you.